Yeah, so I'm Philip Benstead. Uh, the question I usually get asked when I start these things is, what on earth is the AOC? That's the Association of Old Crows to do with electronic warfare and whatever. So a quick bio, you know, I started my career back in the days of the Civil War, 19, uh, sorry, excuse me, the Cold War, 1969, and I was designing and installing or implementing sensor systems, mainly radar, as you could see, all these different systems. That's what we produced, uh, 84 sites, all totally integrated, never ever used in anger, thank goodness. I then joined Plessis and we worked on all sorts of different projects and different kinds of sensors or whatever. I went back into the design stage with Plessy and looking after various things. Some of the babies here, we've got uh, that's Samson, uh, which goes on the Type 45, Type 996 and the Watchman radar, which is still in service. I then moved into Agnos, so the European uh, satellite system, and then Galileo. Um, short time working on these things, Cymax, uh, SCADA, uh, with Siemens, into airport design, and then around about the turn of the century, we were looking at wind farms and their impact on primary radars. So I worked on ADSB multilateration, laterally on the, on the Marshall system for the MOD, and the last seven or eight years on drones. Okay, quickly, let's go down. We're all navigators, navigators, PNT, first acronym. And this has been around for thousands of years. Where am I, where am I going, and what time is it? And of course, these days, it's all down to these things. Health warning, more acronyms coming up. Don't worry about it. So how do we do on reporting? We report in the air, in the air traffic management business, five different ways. The first one is what I call sometimes. So it's the guy in the plane with his radio. If you've got HF or UHF coverage, you report your position. We've got a contract link here, but that costs money. So it's used occasionally, but not very often. And then so we've got radar, ADS broadcast. Don't worry, I'll put the acronyms up. So these are basically sending information down. So the data rates get better. So, we, so that's air traffic services. So that's what we're going to be talking about. So it's data that's going up and down. So there are three pillars of air traffic control, and these go back to after the Second World War when those systems were designed and the procedures, communications, navigation, and surveillance. We're going to be talking about the surveillance ones. First of all, what's air traffic control? It's the safe and expeditious movement of air traffic, obviously. Maintain separation, otherwise this happens. But radar is an advisory service. The ultimate responsibility is with the flyer. So it's really air traffic management, not control. Now, these are my views. I've been an independent consultant for quite a long time. So you won't necessarily get the party line. You'll get what I've found out through all my experiences. So let's look at Europe, single European sky. The current infrastructure for surveillance is this. We have a primary radar, skin radar here, secondary radar, and, we'll and I'll define what all these things are later on and show you how they work, and then another layer. So you have three layers of surveillance. We're now moving to three layers, but different. So the ADS broadcast we're going to be talking about is going to be the contiguous layer. There's gaps in this, not in this, followed by secondary radar, and the primary radar, as you can see by the wording, when required for safety and security. Frankly, for air traffic control, air traffic management, you only need the primary radar when something goes wrong, as in 9-11, of course, famous example. So next time you fly, be assured. Right, the running order of what we're going to talk about. I offered to do four presentations. The answer was yes. So you're getting four for the price of one. So we're going to look at surveillance from the towers, uh, the optical side, obviously, through to TCAS, traffic collision, ADS broadcast, multilateration, wide area. So that's the basic, the, the building blocks, if you like. Then the impact of wind farms on primary radar. What is space-based? That's a new kid on the block. And then some of the issues we've got coming up with Spectrum. Okay. So surveillance is a key enabler, as I said, on the ground with optical devices, 
primary and secondary radar, they're looking for different things. Primary radar and opticals, you're looking for wanted targets, whether they want to tell you or not. So the secondary radar relies on cooperation by transponders, which send information out. So if you ask it, yes, I'm here, and with TCAS, collision avoidance, it's sending information out the whole time. I'm going to run over that a few times, so don't worry. This is what we want to see. We want to see these kind of targets, and we'd love to see these as well, the drones. So you've got basically commercial aircraft, microlights if possible, and so on. These are the unwanted air traffic control targets. The pictures say it all. The new things, of course, are the wind farms of late, and even the effects you get above cooling towers, uh, and an aircraft fades on a radar when it goes over a, a pylon like this, a lump of steel. You're probably wondering what this is. Angels are bubbles of hot air that give you radar returns. You can't see anything, hence the title. But you will get returns from fast cars, trains, that go into the velocity band of the radar. Sea clutter is a nightmare. Rain, not forgetting, of course, swarms of insects, you see, and swarms of birds. So let's start off with the obvious thing. The classic shot, we're in the tower with our binoculars looking for ground movement and approach. But that's changing now, changing very rapidly. You don't need to be in the tower. You just have multi-cameras, you stitch the image together, and you can literally sit in your front room, and it might look like that. So that's the way we're going now. That's the latest one in the States from Frequentis. So you can see all the images are stitched together here. You've got the radar display here, and you've got all your flight plan data here. So it's just like a real tower and a radar room, but again, you can be anywhere. So the leaders in the world are Avinair. They're the uh, Norwegian Air Navigation Service Providers. And up in Buda, up in uh, the north of Norway, where I worked for NATO for a while, beautiful part of the world, they've got what is really is way ahead of anything else. So what you're seeing there is a whole series of bays. There are 15 bays, so you're actually controlling 15 separate airfields from that center. So you could think of the savings, the huge savings in personnel. You don't have to worry about sickness, holidays, whatever. They're all in one place, so you can organize. So it's really the way forward. How do we know it's that good? Well, you've got all these ca clever cameras around the place. And they've got 15 remote tower bays, as I said, four are already complete and working. So by the end of uh, September 22, the whole of Northern Norway will all be controlled from one central area. And obviously they've got plans for the rest of the country. So you can extend this. So there's a series of cameras typical of that for, in Canada. So the kind of thing you can do, these are my thoughts, you can add the zoom cameras. So, for instance, this is a, a, an aircraft taken at night with one of these infrared at 15 kilometer range. So you can, ex, you can extend your tower range. Thanks to Leonardo for that. Right, so we're all navigators. If we, if we sail or if we're marine, this is the kind of radar picture that you want to see. You want to see everything because you don't want to hit this lot. You also want to see AIS, Automatic Information System, the equivalent of secondary radar or ADS broadcast. And you might think, some may think this is what an air traffic control display looks like. Well, it doesn't. That's what a controller likes to see. He just wants these synthetic pictures here, a little dot with a leader line of where it's going, and the identification of each aircraft. Well, the big rule is the I word, integrity. If a radar plot isn't quite right, or if it's delayed, you dump it, you don't display it. We have two kind of targets for radar. We've got these guys here. These are the cooperative ones because they squawk. And I'll explain the term later. Because I've got these things on board. They've got transponders, which that's the transmitter, which sends the information down. 
On the other side, you've got what we call a non-cooperative target, not particularly because they may not want to be cooperative. So if the transponders failed in this Korean airliner, or well, these guys can't afford to fit them because there's no mandate for that, and certainly the drones don't have them, they're non-cooperative. And if you're a fighter, you obviously, you, you will switch your transponder off. To see those, you need one of these. And that's a good old Plessy AR-15 radar from the 70s. This problem has been around since the basically since the 60s. On this side, you need a secondary radar to interrogate and to be squawked at. And at most airports, you will see this. So you can combine the two. So let's look at a terminal area radar. So this is a, an American one. Um, and for the primary radar, you're looking out to 60 miles, 30,000 feet, and you get a plot every four seconds. Note the velocity range, though. You limit it because you don't want stuff getting in, slow-moving stuff on the ground, screwing it up. And you, because it costs money for processing to go to a higher velocity, you go for that. So that's a classic thing. So it's 2D only range and azimuth. But the secondary radar you saw, that works in a different way. That doesn't send a pulse up in the same way. It sends a series of pulses. So there's the aircraft in the sky with this transponder. There's your antenna for the secondary radar. And it's got what we call an interrogator. So it sends up, 1030, a pair of pulses of three pulses. And depending on the spacing, if it's mode A, short spacing, then uh, it's just basically saying, who are you? If it's got a longer pulse, that's mode Charlie, mode C. That gives you height data. How does it do it? Well, in the aircraft, there's this little box here. This is the transponder feed. You get a code from the ground, from a control. That is your code while you're in our area. So you send that code back at 1090 megahertz. The code tells you who you are, and you can decode that to give you the call sign. And then there may be data, in this case, height, which the clever thing down here decodes all the data, and you get a nice picture. And the big advantage is you're out to 250 nautical miles, not just 60 miles. Now, if we take a closer look at the picture, you'll see why secondary radar is so much better. There's a primary target. It's just a blob. Here's a target here with a primary radar and the secondary label. So you've got its altitude, you've got its identification, you've got its ground speed, and the fact that it's got traffic collision avoidance fitted. So much more data. So you know whether it's going up or down, you can tell by the way that, uh, or faster or slower. All right. And we've got about 500 of those stations across Europe at the moment. And as we rationalize and it, technology gets better, those numbers will come down. So technical terms we need to know. We've already talked about the squawk. So we interrogate, and then we squawk back. So that's a once event. That's a single event. Squit is different. But to squit, every half a second, we send out information. So we use that for collision avoidance. We use that for ABS broadcast. So we're going from a data rate of every four seconds to half a second much, much better. Right. How does ADSB automatic dependent surveillance broadcast work? There's a couple of aircraft in the sky. There's GNSS, your satellites. They send down navigational signals to the aircraft. So the aircraft knows where it is. It's got far more information about itself, obviously, than the controller on the ground. So you just send the information down through the ground network that distributes it around. And you also have the information going, if it's fitted properly, between the aircraft. So the pilot or the flyer then sees other aircraft that are fitted, where they are, which way they're going. And on the ground, it integrates beautifully into a conventional air traffic management display. And if you've got Flight Radar 24 on your smartphone, that's where the information comes from, the, the ADS broadcast. And I'll be showing you at the end an example of how useful it is. So if you're a marine person, it's just the same as AIS with the globe tracking and the other, the other uh, applications you can get.
Right. So we've got this ADS broadcast data. It's very useful. But you can improve the integrity by using what we call multilateration or triangulation, just like a GNSS. You're doing something different. So you're using the time of arrival. You know you've got different stations receiving the data from the same aircraft. It all goes back to a center, and you do the calculations based on the times. So it's fairly straightforward. If you've got three ground stations, you get X and Y. With four, you then get the altitude. And you might say, well, so what? Well, the data that's coming down, is altitude data, comes from the aircraft. Now, altimeters are notoriously unreliable. There's been a whole series of crashes uh, due to altimeter problems. And the though it comes down on the secondary radar, you can say, I'm sending height down. If your altimeter's wrong, that's feeding the same wrong data to the ground. So if you ask the controller how high am he, he doesn't know. He can only read out what you're sending him. Whereas with multilateration, you compute the altitude in a different way. Because you've got the ident already, that's not a problem. Right, so it's all down to time difference of arrival, just like GNSS. And unfortunately, it's all at 1090 megahertz again. So Heathrow was the first airport in the world to use multilateration. And you're probably asking why, because there's a very visible surface movement radar uh, on the outer road. Well, the problem is, as you can see, there are lots of places where you can't see. Radar doesn't see, unfortunately, round corners. So what they've done, they've added lots of these all over Heathrow. Now, when they started from memory, I think we started off with 17 of these around Heathrow. To give you this, this is a ground movement sort of picture. Now, so currently upgrading the 31 stations, installing 21 new ones. So that means as the aircraft, as the airport is expanded, you can expand with it very easily and very cheaply. Now, this is what they're doing. Obviously, they work at night for that. But you can see from this how small the antenna is. So if you've got a corner you can't see around, just stick another antenna in with a data fee. Very simple. You can extend that. So multilateration over a wider area, needless to say, another acronym is called WAM. Uh, one of the uh, world leaders on WAM uh, and ADSB is ERA. It's a Czech company. And they, they're doing helicopter monitoring, which is ideal for down to 100 feet, which with a radar you just can't do because of the curvature of the Earth. So that's uh, happening. And then you can do a country. So if you're starting off with a country which is relatively back, backward, like Azerbaijan, you don't need to put lots of radar in. Just go for ADS broadcast. And multilateration, there it is. That's right across the country. And that's just a long-range antenna. That's the only difference you need. Right, back to radar. So here's a typical flight. You've got a radar when you're taking off. You've got a radar waiting for you when you land. And in between for the en route above the transition height of 28,000 feet, you've got an en route radar, which is just bigger. So you're in radar. If you're lucky, you're in radar coverage the whole way. These are the problems. We've had this problem for over 20 years now with wind farms. I won't go through all the bullets, but basically they are big, ugly targets, lots of metal, and they rotate. So they're a perfect primary radar target. Huge fixed returns and lots of Doppler-rich components. And I'll explain the Doppler part in a minute. So the poor old radar. And this is the elephant in the room, always. To continue operation, you have to have a fully approved four-part safety case. So if you want to put a wind farm in, you've got to prove you can mitigate the effects. Otherwise, you'll never get your safety case. You'll never get permission. So why do we have a problem? Well, they're oldie worldy these uh, these and this kind of antenna has been around since the 1950s. And the shape of the beam is like a hand. So it's fairly narrow in azimuth, hopefully, but you need it to be as wide as possible in the vertical extent. Fortunately, that means these days you see wind farms. Now, we've already said we've had fixed and moving clutter 
which you use from day one. All the things we've talked about. So what's the problem? Why doesn't it get rid of them? Well, this is a list of all the signal processing techniques. I'm not going to go through them all. I'm saying it's just trust me. These have been around for a long time. They work very well against conventional clutter when farms gives them a real problem. And all because it's mainly after the signal is received beyond the antenna. So here's a Mickey Mouse drawing of how a primary radar works. You set up a transmitted pulse. A tiny fraction of the energy comes back from the metal frame, hopefully, as an echo. So, and the duplexer to answer your question is, it stops the transmitter blowing up the receiver, basically. So that's how it works. You got the processing and you get a pretty picture on the ground. Now, you remember the picture of the drawing, uh, the drawing of the antenna there that we were looking at here? So this is the vertical coverage diagram, okay? And the way these have worked since the 1970s is you always have a problem low down. So the red beam is a conventional antenna, the vertical beam. You need to tilt it at that angle to get power in the right place. But the problem is down here in the shorter range, you're illuminating lots of fixed clutter, mountains, buildings, all sorts. So when PIN switches were invented uh, back in the late 60s, people thought, ah, we can do something here. We can put a second horn. That's what a horn looks like. We'll put a second horn on there just for receive only. We will tilt it slightly, which makes the beam tilt up. So you've got a receive beam. And then you've got a transmit and receive beam. So very simply, you switch over for, say, a 60-mile radar. You'd switch over at 12, 15 miles, nautical miles. And you go from this beam, which is tilted up, so it doesn't see so much of the ground clutter. Then you go out to this beam here. So that's the way it's worked for many, many years. So say, and you, you know, these are just the patterns, but that's the principle. So how does that affect as well? Let's look at wind turbines and what comes back. So these are what we call polar diagrams. Don't worry about the numbers, but trust me, you get a lot of radar energy back from those. And you also get, that's the front, you actually get more from the back. Wind sensor in the back of the nacelle gives you more than that. And that's looking through the vertical patterns. But the, it's all in the numbers. So a radar will see a small aircraft as a one to two square meter target. A current wind turbine and getting bigger, you're looking at a thousand square meters straight away. And the big problem is, is this, the fluctuation due to the rotation of the blades. It's equivalent to having three Boeing 747s on the pylon rotating. So the returns are absolutely huge and they are fluctuating. Well, so what, you might say. Okay, well, first thing is, all the generators, the gearbox, everything inside is lumpy metal. On the back, they put, usually flat, it's like a corner reflector. If you're a sailor, you'll, you know what the corner reflectors do. And the wind sensor on the top also gives you returns. All right, so it's all down to this man, Christian Doppler. And when he was studying the stars, had to explain how the colours change. And he worked out, very clever guy, that as they moved away, the frequency of the light changed. Hence the, what we call a Doppler effect. Now, air traffic control and air defence radars conventionally work using the Doppler principle. So if it's a fixed target, a hill, a building, a chimney, a mast, you know it's something you don't want to see. There's no Doppler shift rejected. It's a moving target, which gives you Doppler shift, oh, like an aircraft, you retain it, which is great. It's been great for years. The problem is the Doppler shift from rotating blades on wind farms give you horrendous problems and they fill up the processing and saturate it. Why is this? Well, you get the obviously the effect of the rotation and the angle you look as it, the angle you look at it changes, uh, that affects it as well. So if you remember the velocity response of the, the radar, where you don't see the drones and the fighter aircraft, it pretty well fills up all your filters all the way. 
So the poor radar doesn't know what to do. It can't see the target it wants to see. Okay, so we have what we call the processing is done on clutter maps. They get overloaded. Get range side lobes as well as azimuth side lobes. Don't worry about the terminology. What it means is this. Around the wind farm, you also get a lack of sensitivity as well as above it. You also get radar shadowing. So you can tell it's a real problem. And again, in the air defense domain, that allows your enemy to sneak in. But air traffic control, you just lose the target. You get sight effects. If, if it's line of sight, it's great. Not a problem. You can see it. You might be able to work it out. But you tend to get multipath depending on the, the, the air pressure. You get beam bending. You get diffraction, refraction, all sorts of things. And as the blade changes its aspect, which they do, to become more efficient, so they that changes as well. And if you want to go and stand and look at a wind farm, you'll actually find the turbines all point in slightly different directions. If for a sailor, you'll know that somebody sails by, they take your wind. That's exactly the effect. You get inter-turbine reflections. So you can imagine trying to predict all the effects it's pretty well impossible and um, we tried it at university of manchester and gave up it's just impossible to predict so everything varies so it's another fine mess so what do we do about it well let's just look at the problem first of all now i've used a picture of a an analog radar that gives you video because this explains the problem this is uh presswick airport uh, with a common display, 25 mile nautical mile range with five mile range moves. Right, okay. You can see four wind farms here. I will now take a closer look. So you can actually see here these wind terms are visible and the processing isn't taking them out. So that's what a target looks like. That's a primary radar target. This is all the track history. That's the last plot. And next to it is a secondary radar label we were talking about. Now, if we look further south at Haddiard Hill, which has 15 turbines, you can see as we go across the turbines, you get a horrible mess for the primary radar, but the SSL label can be seen. So you're thinking, well, that's great. The only problem is you have to guarantee service if the transponder has failed. So now there's another look. This is a Watchman radar, again, showing an analog picture. The aircraft is going that away. And so you can see as it goes across, you get all the clutter. You get target fades. You get wanted targets go. You lose things. You get unwanted clutter. Now, a Mark I eyeball can pretty well work out that something's going on. So there's another effect. However, in this case... You completely lose it in the middle, so the tracks tend to go wandering off all over the place. So he was doing a pass. He did a triple pass here. But, as we've said, we need a lovely, clean display with just tracks. We can't have those funny things that we've just seen. Otherwise, straight in the bin. Is that word again? Okay, I'm going to come to a bit of a, bit of a nerdy anoraki bit. So if you're going to go and make a coffee or have a... Uh, refill your wine glass. Uh, anyway, here we go. So this is how we mitigate. Well, the first thing is just say no. And for years, this was the case. You can't build a wind farm there. But of course, at long last, the government brought legislation is, sorry, we've got to find a way around it. The CAA have an excellent publication. It's online where you can do a red, green, amber. Can I put it here? Yes, no, possibly. So that's a, a self-assessment one. Well, don't fly over wind farms. Well, in the UK, that's pretty well impossible. Reclassify the airspace. Well, yes, it's difficult and it's expensive. So let's go back to video displays. We can work it out. Sorry, we want clean plots like this. Ah, what about stealth technology? So obvious. So back in 2009, these were the tests that Kinetic did and they use radar absorbent material as part of the blades. And it looked quite promising. And high tech, another company, have been working on it. But 
To date, as far as I'm aware, only one wind farm has been built using this technique. That's in France, where they're very worried over there in France about their MET radars, the meteorological radars. Uh, well, so am I, because they provide the service to the UK now. But, uh, so the other side of stealth technology is, well, why don't you just follow this principle? So it just, at this angle, it bounces off. Well, it's kind of difficult. So for the column, yeah, let's go away from a circular one to these, no, sorry, very expensive, and they need major redesign and how to get lifts and stairs and things inside with a triangular one. Um, this beast, the lightning has got all the front edge of the wing has got uh, stealth, but fine, that's a 75 million at a throw aircraft. Turbines at a million or two a throw, you just can't afford to spend it. So that's pretty well out the window. So let's make mandatory transponder zones over wind farms. In other words, you remember the secondary radar? You have to have it. That's a great way to go. And the CAA wanted to do this, to my knowledge, for getting on for 20 odd years now. Unfortunately, the GA community, especially in the States, are dead against this. It's expensive to fit a transponder to get it certified regularly and so on. So that's not flying at the moment. So here's a sort of obvious way. Well, let's recite the radar so it doesn't see the wind farms. So this is one I did in Liverpool. They got a radar there that was illuminating eight wind farms. I wanted to build more. So the obvious thing to do is to move the radar well, the existing radar was in a pretty bad state. It's very expensive to move a radar. So we sold them a nice new Raytheon ASR-10SS, which you can see in the middle. And we recited it so that you could only see one out of the eight wind farms. And that's where I heard the expression for this, which was Paddy's Wigwam, which is the Roman Catholic Cathedral in, uh, in Liverpool. Okay, so why don't you come for a reduced tower height? Well. Yes, if you can do it and still see the airspace. But also, remember the hand? You can get lubbing as you get closer to the ground. So it can be a problem. So this is an expensive solution. Nats have just bought a 3D radar, three-dimensional, which is like a conventional radar, except it's got individual pencil beams. So you can have much more control on where you put the power and where you receive from. And it comes from Indra but an expensive solution. But again, if it's the right solution, that's it. Let's go with that. Now, do you remember the switching between the beams? Well, the clever people in Intersoft, which is a Belgium company, said, OK, let's go from switching to steering. And they use an immense amount of computing power to do a sum and difference patterns. The advantage of that is, depending on the range, where the clutter is low, you can steer the beam up, medium range, and so on. So depending on your range, you can just put the little null, so we can see here where you've got a wind farm. Very smart system, and they've applied it to quite a lot of air defense radars. And that's the results. There's the wind farms. You put in the vertical clutter cancellation, and you remove them all. Hensolt have a different system, sort of the same, they put a pencil beam in. They have a third beam, and they have, I can only call it a clever box because I'm under a non-disclosure agreement still. I can't talk about it. But basically, it sorts out the beams, and you effectively come up with a null. Right. Okay, well, let's look at the other thing. We remember the Mark One eyeball. So I'm looking at a display, and I see three good plots. So the eye here says, ah, that is a track. They're all going the same place. I got position and time, so a computer can do that, a processor. And that's basically the way we work in air traffic management. Very useful, especially when you've got another aircraft. If you remember the leader lines, you can work from that where it's going. Uh, so that's great. However, over a wind farm, and these are real trials. So there's an aircraft track on the radar. Over the wind farm, you get brakes. So the tracker did a pretty good job in working it out but there are still too many breaks and a false target to be acceptable as change. But it can be part of a solution, a mitigation. Here's a very pragmatic solution. 
I sat down and worked out over a lot of coffee with Cambridge Airport. I wanted to put a wind farm in, but it was under a, an emergency area. Uh, Cambridge is unique. They use it for military repair, civil, there's a bit of GA. Um, so we came up with a deal. We said, OK, we'll enhance the air traffic control facilities and then we'll put in a separate suite with displays and a recorder to teach the controllers what it looks like when an aircraft comes in over the top. I say it was only a rarely used bit of airspace. We went to the Civil Aviation Authority, the Military Aviation Authority. They said yes, and then it went. So everybody was happy. So non-auto initiation zones. Don't worry about the words. Very simple. Remember, you've got plots, and then you form a track. Okay, That's great. So once the tracks go, and that's, that's wonderful. The only problem is, if you've got a wind farm there, you get thousands of plots. So the poor little tracker goes, I'm going to produce hundreds of tracks, all of which are false. So what do you do? You just put an electronic zone over the top. So you don't form any tracks. You ghost it through, and then you look for the aircraft coming out. So obviously that's only suitable. It works for small wind farms. Thales have got a wind farm filter. There's little data in the public domain. I'm afraid I can't talk about it because I'm under an NDA. Basically, it's a filter that looks at the orientation of the rotor and the bleeds, and you've seen the problem with that. And then it does estimates and acts as a filter. Thales are also doing other work, which I'll mention later on. Uh, BAE on the uh, cows in the Isle of Wight, they, they do a, something on based on clutter maps. So again, Raytheon have got a system which they've never taken beyond a patent, unfortunately, where they have a little mini 3D radar sitting underneath. But uh, again, that's never being offered. Now, this is the dream radar. Anybody in radar, if you mention Merrill Skolnick, gets down and kisses the ground. Amazing guy. Uh, when I was working in California a long time ago in the 70s, I, I went to a, a lecture at Caltech on his dream radar, as he described it. And basically, it's something that scans in every direction. And that's what it is. It's called a holographic radar. It's, uh, it was developed by a company in Cambridge called Avalent, who had been bought by Thales. It's best known, sorry, this is the beams in space. So you are continuously, it doesn't rotate. It's an array, so it goes around in every direction. That's the broad beam transmit beam, and you interlace meshes of receive. Mainly used for detecting drones. There's one of these at Heathrow. There's one at Shardigal. Uh, but they've built a bigger version now, up to 60 nautical miles, I understand. Um, so that can be used for air traffic control. It, it is a great idea. It's the future. But obviously, it's expensive. So let's look, look at some more off-the-wall stuff. Non-cooperative targets, obviously from the military, lots of those. Lockheed Martin, uh, I've got something called Silent Sentry. We're back to multilateration. You've got these FM transmitters on the ground. They're very inefficient power-wise. They pump out loads of power, reflects off the aircraft, goes down. So this is basically doing, again, time of arrival, and it works out exactly where you are in three dimensions. He uses the scattered signals. It's passive, no moving parts. You don't need to apply for a transmitter license or pay for it. 3D tracking, and you get velocity as well. Brilliant. What could possibly go wrong? Well, fortunately, getting a safety case for this in a civil environment is almost impossible. We're moving to DAB, which is far more efficient in terms of power. The antennas make the power hug the ground. So... Let's look at a proven solution. So thanks to BAs for this, uh, this little diagram. So you put another radar in. There's your main radar. It's got wind farms that it can see. So you put a second radar in your terrain screen, its coverage. So it can see the aircraft, but not the wind farms. And then you integrate the data. It's fine. There we go. You may have secondary radar data as well. You've got to combine. It's robust. It's proven, but expensive. You've got to buy another primary radar. And anything to do with wind farms could have 25-year life. No question. 
okay you may get registration errors at different heights but they're solvable problems and of course it's no use for offshore so we we kind of look at other radars now so let's look at putting a little short range radar on the same frequency so it just looks over the top of the wind farm where the problems are fast scan and narrow beam width you can see it looks like a marine radar it's an s band the same as the primary higher resolution so again you integrate them together it is a proven solution with a twist in the tail lower capital cost because it's smaller and it's close by to the main radar, it's on the airfield. So that's great. So we did it, uh, Sea Speed did it, American company. Um, so this is a, near Manston Airport looking over the Thanet wind farm and it works beautifully. So they got it in, they got their safety case. This was Sea Speed's first excursion into Europe. They are very pleased. And of course, you now know Manston is uh, just a lorry park. So they've sold the, the uh, Talish radar, the parent radar, and got rid of this. Very sad for Sea Speed. And whenever I ask them if they're interested in some business in Europe, funnily enough, they don't seem to be. So, so let's follow that up and say, okay, if I go to a higher frequency, I get a narrower beam width. So I can be even more precise. So what Terma did, they took their standard scanter radar, very well known, very well proven, 42 mile range. And they said, okay, what we'll do, we'll take that with this resolution of 36 meters compared to, say, 150 for a conventional radar. So it is a lot better, a one degree azimuth resolution. They mixed it with their surface movement radar, which has very high resolution processing, and they came up with a Ford 002. Now, this gives you phenomenal range resolution. So I say, if you look at 150, say 200 for a conventional radar, it's, it's just amazing the difference, and it works. So if you go to Horden, where the Airbus is, where there's the guppy coming in and out, you'll see these. Go to Edinburgh. So uh, Nats have put quite a lot of these in around the UK. It's a very resilient, robust solution. So we're just moving on now. We're jumping forward to November 2020. This was after I retired. So the UK offshore industry, this is a press release, is actually £2 million in funding. So contracts have gone to Tallis. They're working with Birmingham University. Uh, Kinetic, needless to say, and TWR working on more RAM-type things, radar absorbent material, and Saab are looking at radar, plus DTS are looking at processing things. And I understand that uh, the Offshore Wind Industry Council, they funded some trials next summer. Literally, they will stick a radar. That's what this is in the middle of a wind farm and monitoring it because it's all been on hold for COVID. Suddenly, they're trying to move ahead. Now. And the leaders of a lot of this are SSE, Scottish and Southern. Let's look at the emerging issues now. So we've solved a lot of the problems. We're looking at more. Now, of course, we've got floating wind farms. They're tethered but they do move around. So if you've got a system for mitigation that relies on them not moving, then you've got a problem. The other thing is they're getting bigger and bigger. The latest beast, which has just been commissioned at Rotterdam, is the GE Haliad, uh, which is 220 metres high. So it's getting big. And you can see the trend here. So that's what it looks like. There's its scale. There's the Eiffel Tower. So you're moving on. So you're looking at a 107 meter long blade. They're going to put 200 of those are planned for the Dogger Bank, where it's quite shallow. So imagine mitigating that. I'm glad I've retired. Stop Press, just announcement a couple of days ago, Vester and Siemens, they're going to go to 120 meter blades from 107. The higher you get, the more efficient and so on. And I guess there's a bit of macho in there saying, oh, mine's bigger than yours. One of the concerns is the whip you're getting in the wind, which may strike the column, and it may cause more Doppler. I don't know. And this is really looking into the future. So this is uh, from the Catapult Offshore Renewable Energy, which, by the way, if you want to look at this, it's an amazing website, all the work that's going on. It is really incredible. 
So what the effect of these is going to be is huge things. I don't know. I'm trying to predict those. The conventional ones is bad enough. The other emerging issue is, is the reduction in radar cross-sectional area. Everybody's moving to composites. And you think it might be a small reduction. If you look at the DA42, the diamond there, it goes down by a factor of eight. The other problem, nothing to do with wind farms, is for more conventional aircraft like this, they're now moving, they're changing the skin from, comp from aluminium to composite, but of course you're removing the screening effect of the sensitive electronics inside the aircraft. So if you're coming in to land, you go past the radar, we'll see if I have to do it. But that's outside of the mandate. So right, we're moving on, we're getting towards the end, the last two shorter sections. So let's look at ADS broadcast a little bit more. You remember that? So, and the squitter and the squit. So the squit is important for traffic automatic collision avoidance. This lady shouting at us every half second. Okay. TCAS, which has been mandatory in Europe only since the year 2000, amazingly, literally, it does everything. You're squitting, it receives it, it's got enough information to work out the right way to go when you're close by. So the pilot, in theory, should just follow the TCAS. How uh, Many people may remember the Erbelungi mid-air collision where I think it was 45 Russian schoolchildren were killed because the pilot asked the controller at the last minute what to do. The controller was on his own, two displays, his equipment wasn't working properly. He gave the opposite advice to TCAS, hence the disaster. And of course, the guy paid his, for it with his life. So there was a similar incident in Japan with between two Japanese airline flights. So in 2004, the, the advisory is take notice of the TCAS. So how does it work? Well, basically, it says 35 to 48 seconds away, you get a traffic alert which says, look out the window. When it gets closer, you get a resolution advisory which basically says, do whatever. And this is on the screen. So this is... As I say, it only came in in 2000, so a lot of the TCAS traffic displays were retrospectively fitted. So you can see this is the guy you got away from. You've only got seconds to do it. This is an advisory saying, oh, you're on the same altitude, and these are all non-threat targets. So it's fairly simple in the way it's fitted. Obviously, with the that's a retrofit, the later ones you go to a fully integrated display. And most important, you get the climb, climb, climb in one plane and descend, descend, descend in the other. So, TCAS message, it follows exactly the same format as some of the other systems like ADS Broadcast and Mode S. So you've got a front end, I'm a TCAS message. This is my information on where I am. And then there's a unique, every airframe has a unique code. Similar to the ADS broadcast message, as I said, secondary radar, when you're sending data up and down, again, we're sending data down, preamble to say what it is, then you get a shorter long data block, depending on how much information you're sending down, all at the same frequency, all at the same data rate. So long or short data blocks. Okay, ADS broadcast, again, it's very similar. So you've got all these similar message formats flying about and there are there are hybrid versions obviously right okay so let's look at what happens next so you remember how it worked ads broadcast has registers and registers full of data from here so this is the aircraft fit we mentioned the gps we also get the configuration data who i am what i am the air data computer information the yes, no ADS broadcast, stuff out the flight management, and the wow switch, we wait on wheels. When you've landed, it tells you that, and shuts off the main power from the transponder just for the TCAS on the ground. So it all comes out the antenna. So, yeah, we get all this information. I won't take you all through it, but you can see, you know, even down to the roll angle, the track angle, the true heading. It's got a huge amount of information. 
that's kind of one of the problems, in my opinion. Too much information. But it's very, very useful. There was a tragedy earlier this year out in Indonesia, Jakarta. The guy took off, went up, and literally just crashed into the sea. But this is straight off uh, flight twenty, flight radar 24. So anybody can access information. So you can see here what we've got. We've got the speed. We've got the altitude. We've got all the parameters are all there. Um, there was a problem with the left-hand engine. Uh, we still don't know why it crashed, but they, they, had, they had other problems as well. It looked like the left-hand engine went funny. Right, so ADS broadcast, let's look at the take-up. So if you look at the equipage across Europe for the latest version, back here, January 2018, we were down in the 25% of all aircraft had this fitted. Now look at this. Despite COVID, October 2020, we're up around about the 80%. So it's really moving on very quickly. And that's just a, another way of showing it. Whether we'll ever, ever get to 100%, that's where we are now. And these are just the regulations. Anything of, of 5.7 tonnes maximum takeoff weight. And then these are the transponder. There are two organisations, one in Europe, one in America, K and RTCA to set the standards, and they're usually pretty similar. Okay, so ADS broadcast is wonderful. Why do we need space-based? Well, let's look at the ground cover for conventional ADSB. Don't worry about the, the colors of each individual thing. Just look at the coverage on the ground. So at 3,000 feet, you've got this kind of coverage. Obviously, at 30,000 feet, you've got a Huge amount more. But what about these guys over here? What's happening over here? Nothing. So that's why we need space-based. We are limited in range. Now, if I'd have been given this presentation last May, I would have said there are two competitors. There's Aerial Maritime, who are doing ADS broadcast and AIS, the marine system. And the Aerion, which is a spinner from Iridium, they're just doing ADS broadcast on 1090. Last June, GOM Space, who own Aerial Maritime, decided to pull the plug. Um, there are manufacturers of Cube Satellites. Um, so they decided, no, Arion, I think, my interpretation, Arion are way ahead. Times are hard. So we'll, they pull the plug and they're trying to sell the eight that are in orbit at the moment. And just for completeness, it's not the Aerial Maritime UK company that does photographic reconnaissance. Right. So let's stay with Arion. And it's all in this context, I think. I think we all worry about all the traumas after the Malaysian Airlines flight went down. We just didn't have a clue where it was. So we said ground-based ADSB, we're range limited. 30% of the world in early 2019 was covered by the surveillance I've been describing. Now, 2019, April, we suddenly got 100% global coverage, all thanks to this. So this is the Arion system. It's taken them eight years to deploy, so you can imagine the investment. So they've put up 66 satellites. These are conventional satellite planes, 11 per plane. They've got nine in orbit as backup, again, to get the safety case certification. Six on the ground waiting to go. So that's what a satellite looks like. The payload is that, those little white boxes, which comes from the Harris Corporation. So how does it work? So we've got our aircraft up in the sky, squitting away, giving all its information. So it's sending out all the stuff we've been talking about. It goes to the nearest satellite, picks it up in the plane. Now, if this isn't over a teleport, a ground station, it's, it cross-links to the satellite that it is, sends the information down to the teleport and then across into the operations center out to the processing and distribution. So the air navigation service provider, so it's the UK, will then get all that information as a conventional picture. One of the disadvantages of the data rate was predicted to be about eight seconds, but in fact, we're coming in at four and five seconds. So it is a lot better. 
it, all the information is sent using uh, its standard interchange messages. So it comes up just looking like a normal picture. Right. Let's look at the risks. It's in the low Earth orbit. There's an awful lot of space junk there. And that's a coming problem with Elon Musk chucking up even more. But the good news is um, if you get a CME, a coronal mass ejection, obviously in the, in the low orbit, you're less susceptible. Now, there were three events last November, one day, but it wasn't wasn't too bad. So that is the worldwide cover. Absolutely amazing. We've suddenly got, for the first time ever, and of course at the, the higher areas up in the en route, above 28,000 feet, that's where it is important. Let's look at the North Atlantic tracks. So as you can see by the date, they were all, well, I, I guess we were, it's pre-COVID, so uh, it was busy then. So these were the tracks that are coming across. And you'll notice how symmetrical they are. Because covering this whole area, so these are the three areas that we're looking at, Shanwick under UK control, Reykjavik uh, is under, obviously, the Soviet control. That's these guys here. And then the Gander area is under NAVCANA and part of it on the FAA. So you've got these different air navigation service providers looking over it. Because we didn't know what's going on for years and years and years, they had an organized track structure for safety. Otherwise, you maintain your separation, but that's inefficient in terms of uh, emissions fuel because you couldn't take advantage of prevailing winds. That's what the picture looked like. This is from the Arian system. So, very recent uh, press announcement. NATS and NAV Canada, the two air navigation service providers, are going to start trials allowing a choice of track free flying, if you like, which will take advantage of prevailing winds to try and reduce fuel and emissions. So we are starting to get benefits. And again, amazing, we're looking across the North Pole for the very first time. Africa, interesting slide, just shows wherever the money is, the flights are. So, and then the Pacific, of course, where uh, the Malaysian flight went down. So the other big date was June 2019. They got full approval for air traffic services and interestingly for air navigation services. So that's surveillance moving on. The ownership also is very interesting. Five of the owners are air navigation service providers. And the purists might say, what's an air navigation service provider doing buying systems? They shouldn't be doing that. They're service providers. But obviously, it's in the interests of NAV Canada and the UK and the Irish Aviation Authority to be that. Interestingly, again, the Italians and the Danes have come on board. So that's the ownership. So needless to say, the first customers, as always, Hong Kong and Singapore are always in. They're always the innovators. Isavia, the Reykjavik, Iceland people, they were the very first customer for obvious reasons. And out of that, we're now seeing spin-offs. We're getting gate-to-gate -gate data services being offered by Arion. FAA have signed up an agreement. 29th of January, recent stuff, airports of authority, they've gone operational, monitoring the third largest airspace. And an, an Avinor, again, you remember the, the, the Buda area where they are not only got remote towers, but they're doing helicopter monitoring. They're also going to use it for that area as well. Uh, so they, the Norwegians are always like that. They're ahead of the game, so they've got different layers now of surveillance. And on the 23rd of February, the Asavia, the, the Arctic area, went fully operational. So it's moving on a pace. If you want to see more, go on the Arian website. As I say, that there is no competition now. That's why I can sing their praises. Right, the final section. We're nearly there, guys. Spectrum pollution and mitigation methods. Okay, so this is just some examples. Um, everybody's talking about selling off the spectrum at the moment. So the altimeter or altimeter in America, they work on radars, the electronic altimeter, not the barometric ones, which uses this frequency, 4.2, 4.4 gigahertz. 
which has been fine for years. The selling off 5G, as you know, and the band they're selling off in America, shortly the UK, but in America is here. This is applied, I don't know if you know, but for 5G, you have the very highest frequency for the city centres, medium frequency for what we call the metro area, the suburbs, and then the long range stuff is on 700 megahertz. So for the metro area, where the airports are, of course, they're selling off this band, and why they're selling it off, that's the reason, $81 billion. Nice, nice if you can get it. And that gave them getting on for 6,000 spectrum blocks. So could it compromise it? I don't know. It's, it's a big question, and we're not really going to know. So the mitigation, they say, because it is... At the moment, it's, it's the main sensor for the ground proximity warning system is that. So it's a barometric altimeter. That's the backup. So there are all sorts of pros and cons. We won't know in the UK. They delayed the selling off until March, maybe longer. And this is an old chestnut being going on for about 13 years ago. Ligada networks have a terrestrial L-band network. And there is a big worry because FCC have just, the American, have just given them approval for it. Will it interfere with GPS and satellite communications? L-band, and this is it, from 1.1 gigs all the way up to 1.6, the whole band is stuffed full of satellite and navigation communications. So there are a lot of issues because, say, the tests that have been done aren't valid. But they got approval, so will it affect TCAS? Will it affect flight management systems? Who knows? And, of course, the one we've been I've been talking about all evening, the crowded 1090 megahertz. I've only been talking about the civils. Of course, the military, the IFF, uh, is on the same frequency as well. Here in control, have issued the statement, potential to threaten safe and efficient operations. And there is a monitoring program going on right across Europe. Who knows? Now, my personal view is stop interrogating so much. Interrogate less. You don't, most air navigation service providers, in my view, over interrogate, and there needs to be a program to reduce that. Okay, we've already got other techniques mode select and clusters. We talked about mode select where the interrogator on the ground pairs up with an aircraft. It doesn't need to keep interrogating it because it's got all the data as to where it's going. So you just extend that by saying, well, I've got this target. I'll hand over to my body because it's moving towards this radar coverage. So that's that. That was all proved during the poems program between the UK, France and Germany, I think 17 years ago, but hasn't really been adopted. And in America, they have a second frequency up to flight level 18,000 feet. But unfortunately, it's right in the middle of our uh, navigation band, so difficult for us to do. So finishing with two questions. The first one is, 1090 megahertz is a mitigation the ADS broadcast because we can reduce the uh, secondary radar interrogations. And the final question, well, is it one pillar of air traffic control? We had communication, navigation and surveillance. They're all wrapped up in one. Lots of acknowledgements, peer reviewers, thank you very much for that. All these different organizations, especially for Michel Carindentli of Arion, for giving me some of his slides to show. You can see oh, these are the 46 different organizations that I've worked with over the last 20 years on these problems. And finally, a big acknowledgement for this lady, my wife, who puts up with me jetting off before COVID all over the place and spending hours in the study. So thank you for listening. Time for questions or comments. <laughs>